this is for uh, Mohammed. Um, I, I wasn't sure, when you presented your, your question, so um, I wasn't sure whether you have considered the possibility of having endogeneity problems between the relationship between violence and inequality. You probably, as far as I saw, you, is not potentially addressing these uh, issues, and, uh, and I wonder what you think about this. And then on the um, inverted U-shape function that you observe, um, it is interesting, but I'm not quite sure what is the theory behind that. So, in principle, you perhaps suggest that the middle class has the tendency to be more prone to violence, which it is not actually observed in most of the countries that I know. So, could you tell me the theory or the theory behind what are your assumptions or your clues about what is explaining this curve? Yeah. Uh, Ellen Huanyemi, MTT Finland. I also have a question to Mohammed uh, because I would like you to uh, clarify what is the difference between vertical and horizontal uh, inequality because I have uh, difficulty understanding that why vertical uh, inequality will cause violence. That what is the reason behind it? And, and also that uh, how robust are your, your, your estimations to show that, that there is a direct link between vertical uh, inequality and violence? Thank you. I'm Anja Rita Ketakoski uh, from the International Law Association, and I noticed Mohammed used the term routine violence. I understand it means uh, also violence against women, which in the legal system now has its new convention who has come into force. And of course, it's a, a huge problem. Uh, I don't know whose idea it is to call it routine. Uh, is it coming from the World Bank vocabulary? As My idea. It's your idea, okay. <laughs> Then I, uh, I do want to know in what way the Indonesian uh, system of uh, addressing violence is gender literate and what is to be plan planned to make it visible if you include it in routine. I think um, that might be a, not such a good idea. And uh, then I wanted to ask, uh, if I may, uh, from the last speaker also, Namibia is famous, at least in Nordic countries, for the experiment of uh, um, basic income. And uh, everybody is now interested in, uh, on international level also, Indians and others are doing experiments. We are waiting for a Canadian researcher to come and tell about the Canadian experiment. Could you say something about that experiment and how you classify it in your system? What is it as a revenue when you have a basic income in an area? Thank you. Thanks, uh, Andrew Carr from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. I've got one question for Richard and one for Blessing. Um, or maybe a few for Richard. Um, so I didn't really understand at all uh, what your regression analysis was, was doing. I think that's partly my unfamiliarity with these issues. But fr from what I, the basic that I got is that you've got household specific prices on the left and you've got some measure of consumption or income uh, for the household on the right. You're trying to see if poorer households face higher prices. So then I was just wondering about how then you are valuing the consumption expenditure that comes from own production. Because uh, surely then you're going to be using prices to do that. So now you've got prices on the left and prices on the right. Uh, and then also, was the survey conducted over the whole year? It would be helpful to show us in the beginning, I mean, if it's quite dramatic, to show us the difference in prices that households of, of are facing 
uh, over the course of the year, if you've got households being interviewed at different periods in the year and if the survey people provided you with that data. I don't know if they did. Uh, uh, well, sorry, one more question. In the beginning, one of the things you said is that maybe search costs make it like a U-shape, so the poor and the rich maybe face higher prices. If that's true, why were you then just doing uh, it's positive or it's negative, and that means either the poor pay more or, or they're less. If there's some U, U shape like that, then maybe what you were doing wasn't quite right. But I wasn't sure, as I said, I wasn't so familiar with those methods. And then uh, for blessing, there's this famous case in Deaton paper for South Africa on, the, on our old age pension, where you showed us that social assistance looks very tiny because inequality is so big, I think. The social assistance looks very small in the percentage of total income. But the case in Deaton paper makes the really good point that, sort of by accident almost, that per capita, that the old age pension is three times, I think, per capita income for, South, for black South African households. So it might look small because if you look at it the way you did, but if you, if you think about it in terms of that, you know, poor people's incomes, it's actually very big. So maybe you could just tell us whether that's true or not uh, for Namibia. Thanks. Thank you for those questions. Uh, the first one on endogeneity. If you are thinking of the link between uh, large scale civil war, yeah, uh, massive violence and inequality, you may think of uh, the violence uh, disproportionately affect the poor and then that uh, change the distribution of income or asset or whatever. Uh, this is different kind of violence. This is low uh, scale of violence. So I'll, I'll connect this one with the typology of violence that we are trying to develop based on one country data from one uh, source of information. So this is not preconception idea. So the classification is based on we put all the violence data on the table and then we find the best way to classify the violence. So we have three types of violence. The first one, during the democratic transitions. The first one is the secessionist conflict or civil war between the few regions and the central. Okay? And then on top of that, we have the inter-ethnic violence. So, and then we have also a pool of residuals. So we are not sure how to classify the residuals of uh, the violence data that we have. So, but the best way to classify that one is routine. Routine means there is no uh, pattern of regional and time concentrations, different from the first two category, where we can see that the episodic violence concentrated during the particular time and in few regions. So based on that classifications, we differentiate the two between the episodic and the routine. So the main forms of the routine violence is in the forms of gang fights, a youth brows, a vigilantisms, and to be honest, uh, we, we are not separating uh, 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 the violence against women here. I mean, uh, we are not able to, to classify, to, to extract that one from the data. So that's the, the, the nature of the data that we are dealing with, okay? So, so that's what I can say about, about the, okay, so back to the endogeneity. So I think we can rule out that one from the nature of the link between inequality and violence. Uh, I have no proof from the uh, equations, but I think the next thing that, I can, that we can do is to try to use a time lag, for example. So this is the first draft of the, of the paper. So that's what, what, what I can think now, to use the, the lag uh, between uh, inequality and violence, so just to, to, to take into consideration that one. Uh, that's uh, two, two answers that I can give for, for the endogeneity. Uh, one from the conceptions of the low-level violence and inequality, the, the, uh, where the effect of violence on inequality can be ruled out because it's not a large-scale violence that destroy the economy totally, for example. And the second one is maybe to introduce the time like in, in the revision of the paper. Uh, the next, uh, your, your second question is about the inverted U-shape. This is the first paper to introduce that kind of relationship. If you look at the link between uh, civil war and uh, income, in most cases you have the negative relationship. So lower income uh, correlates with the uh, civil war. So this is the, the most common and the most robust finding so far in terms of conflict regressions. But when you look at the data, uh, we, we deal with different kinds of set of data in, in, in one country context. So we find that kind of uh, 
empirical re regularity, that kind of relationship. So now we have to find how to do that one. So I look at the uh, Robert Bates uh, book about prosperity and violence, uh, explaining the rise of violence in the medieval Europe, for example. So it, from, from the historical account, there is a hypothesis saying that initially violence will go in hand with the increase in prosperity because of the absence of uh, regulatory functions, uh, the, the greedy behavior of the fortunate, the grievances of the less fortunate, things like that. So we use that one to explain the upswing of the uh, curve. And then the downswing, you have, uh, at some point in time, uh, violence has to be contained. And uh, at a higher level of income, you have a stronger state capacity, things like that. So, so that's the way we, we explain the, the, the inverted U-shaped relationship between violence and income in the context of uh, low-scale violence. Uh, of course, this is intuitive, uh, 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 but uh, as you know, in the regressions, we can only draw the empirical link. Most of, most of the link is about associations, but we draw from the theory, from the anthropological study, from case study, we draw the logic that to explain that empirical reg uh, re regularity. If I can move quickly to the second question, so about vertical inequality, horizontal inequality. Okay, vertical, horizontal inequality is clear. The relationship between vertical inequality and large-scale ethnic conflict or civil war is clear. No doubt about that one. The logic is clear. So what about the vertical inequality? We link vertical inequality with uh, low-scale uh, violence which doesn't involve the notions of ethnicity. So there is no ethnic uh, divide in the context of routine violence that we are talking about. So we understand this one as high level of inequality will create a sense of frustrations, for example, a sense of grievances. But there is no direct target of that grievances. Not the, the ethnic A is richer than ethnic B or region A is richer than region B because we are not talking about horizontal inequality. So that's why. Differentiating uh, vertical in, uh, inequality and horizontal inequality is really, really important to link inequality and conflict. So, because this cannot be done at the cost country level, we can do this one at within country level. So that's why uh, I'm going to argue that it is not uh, wise to totally dismiss the role of vertical inequality. But if you go to cross country study, there is no one uh, considering Gini as the uh, uh, one of the determinants of civil war, for example. So that's, that's uh, uh, my explanation. The last one, routine violence against women. So that's the nature of the data. We are dictated by the data. And you know that <coughs> violence data is really uh, controversial. I mean, I mean uh, what I can say now is this is the best available data at the country level with the similar political and social context uh, with the same methodology of uh, data collections. So this is the best available data that we can have now. Thank you. Let's move to reach uh, blessing. Uh, please, uh, okay. Um, basic income, the basic income grant, um, an interesting concept. And the, a few years ago, Namibia did an experiment in an area called Oshivelo, where they offered a basic income grant to the whole community. Um, there are some groups that are really advocating for it and say given the levels of poverty that we have, I think this is one way we can help the poor members of society. But what seems to be lacking is the political will to go that route because I think the government is a bit fearing that they may not be able to sustain it in the future. And we, we had um, a conference last year on social security in Namibia, where the current uh, president in waiting, the prime minister, showed significant interest in it, or he has been a supporter of it. But I think within the political circles, selling it out uh, to, to people to say, we shall be transferring a certain amount of money to people every month, um, irrespective of who they are and what they are doing. I think they are finding it a bit difficult. Um, so. The idea is still there. There are still people pushing. And the results from Oshivelo have shown very interesting outcomes that many households that could initially not afford get food, they are able to. Some have started small enterprises where they are buying, they say, flour, they make some cookies and sell. And they have also been able to send their children to school. Quite interesting outcomes. But whether that can be replicated, I 
across the country, and the cost attached to that is the issue. Then the basic social grant, uh, I'm not sure how much they pay in South Africa per per uh, old age person, but uh, in Namibia it was about 500 a few, last year, they recently increased it to uh, $600 per person, which compared to the monthly costs as per the poverty uh, lines is reasonable, but still maybe not as much um, I, uh, we couldn't calculate the, or we couldn't use the total income figures because of the problems I mentioned with the data. But uh, if you disaggregate the data by main income source, which we did here, main income source, about 10% uh, of the households uh, say their main income source is the basic social grant. And the majority of them is mainly um, labor income. Uh, thanks, Andrew, for your questions. Um, remember what I'm, I'm trying to do here. Uh, I've said when I'm looking at you trying to check whether it's a poverty penalty, you can use the regression, which is what most studies do, uh, Beta 2010 and others, but that is not very useful in, in terms of what I want to do in the paper, right? A better way of doing it would be, would be to use a concentration index. So it doesn't really matter whether the effect is U-shaped or whatever. All I want to check is whether it is there, right? So I want to check whether it's indeed there's a poverty penalty, right? So if high prices are concentrated in, among poor households, that's all, right? That's, that's the issue. So it doesn't matter how... So the, the other issue that you're talking about, the regression, that's a standard Deaton uh, identity, that you have prices... Uh, being decomposable into a quality effect and then uh, and, and an income effect, right? So, so it's a standard data on regression. I just use that to then uh, page the uh, quality effects in my in my regression. So again, there's no 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 uh, no problem there. On price variation across the year, yes, you are right. The data was collected over the year, actually from March to March of the other year, and therefore what I did was to say, as my best category, I chose February as my best. So I'm saying, okay, rural. February, prices in February, right? And then I use that as a base. So it, in a sense, captures the variation in prices across the year. Thank you. Okay, we can take another round of questions. Hi, I'm um, Laura from Salamash University in South Africa. I have a question for Richard. Um, so in the beginning, on your first or second slide, you listed the different reasons why um, the poor might be paying more for um, food, and I was wondering if you did any sort of post-estimation descriptive statistics, just sort of exploring which one of those were applicable for your result. So why did you find the result that you had? I'm just sort of interested in the mechanism, um, because I think that's sort of what's important for um, any policy initiatives to combat the result. Hi, um, I'm Tanya Pon San Krajang from Chulalongkorn University in Thailand. Um, I have a question for Mohammed. Um, because um, the routine violence um, covers a lot of dimensions of violence, right? So, um, like many types of violence. So, I'm wondering whether you have considered to look more into the um, mechanism or the channels um, through which um, inequality affects um, routine violence. For example, perhaps um, instead of looking at um, inequality per se, probably if you have the data, um, like income differentials between groups, like ethnic groups, or ma majority and minority, or between gender. So, so that's kind of tell can probably tell you more about um, the mechanism of bargaining power um, between groups. Yeah, and um, perhaps um, income differential between um, different uh, ethnic groups may help address the endogeneity problems that Miguel raised. Like, because I, I also think that there that may be endogeneity problem through ethnic diversity. So if you can clarify that um, it's not so just some thought. Okay, 
Uh, I am Gogan from University of Malawi. My question goes to Muhammad. I was looking at the equation, violence is equal to inequality and others. Or maybe on the others, I missed out something. When you're looking at violence, where there is violence, there are definitely some groups that are formed to mitigate against the violence. So I'm just interested, is it not proper maybe to look also into what were the number of groups that were formed maybe in regions that were against the violence? Or I missed it if it was there in the others. Thank you. No, to say the number of groups formed against violence that people form in societies against the violence that's happening within the society. Or there were no groups that were formed to mitigate the violence within the societies that the violence was taking place. I'm trying to understand. Okay, let me make it clear. For instance, at national level, there is a violence in DRC. You have the AU sending some forces to combat the violence, to help in combating the violence. So I'm saying within the regions that were in which there was violence, were there no groups that were formed to mitigate the violence, maybe regional groups, that may be included in the equation to, as one of the variables to affect the violence within the equation? My name is Prudence Magejo from University of the Witwatersrand in South Africa. I have a question directed towards blessing. Um, when you drew your Lawrence case, you said you are comparing the individuals that have incomes main source from the pension system or the social system compared to those who have income from the labor market. I personally think that that comparison would be confounded because people whose main source of income is from social security are already a homogeneous group such that you're going to find lower inequality among them. I think wouldn't it be possible for you to do a counterfactual analysis to say if there is no social grant system in place, this would be the inequality that we get and then when they get income, it reduces inequality to this extent. Thank you. Okay, I have a question for Blessing. Uh, I think we, we are looking at social protection programs here, and um, immediately I want, we want to know, actually as a policy question, as to whether um, uh, poverty is also higher in areas where population is higher. Because you mentioned that um, some of the rural areas cannot be reached, for example. But uh, if poverty is higher in those rural areas, then the uh, social protection programs becomes an issue. Therefore, um, I'm asking as to whether you are able to decompose your uh, poverty estimates by population uh, shares. Thank you. Okay, we, we can have uh, responses from the presenters. So we have about uh, six minutes. We start from uh, um, Richard. Okay, Richard. Okay. Thank, uh, thank you, Nora, for your question. Actually, the issue of mechanisms actually was analyzed in another paper, which is forthcoming in the Journal of International Development, where I show that actually uh, there's uh, evidence of nonlinear uh, pricing, which, which coming from quantitative discounting. Uh, so the, one of the channels that I mentioned there is quantitative discounting, and I, I find evidence of quantitative discounting in the maize market. Thank you. All right, I will start with the last question that uh, came, that is directed at me, the decomposition of the inequality by population shares. Um, we will try to do that, but uh, the problem that we've been facing is the quality of the data that we have and trying to get more assistance from the statistics uh, guys. We may be able to get something different, but um, I doubt it with the social protection, particularly the basic social grant, because 
although there are some areas that are not covered, generally the coverage now for the basic social grant is about 95%, which is quite high, and that may not significantly change the results that we have, but we could try to do that. Then with the first question, um, what we did was, again, it comes to the data issue. The best we could do was to try and decompose the, well, we, we have the main sources of income and not all the sources to say uh, uh, the total income is this, which I think if we had that, we could do a bit more. So what we did was to, to identify those households that say their main source of uh, income is say the social assistance. And then we look at the Gini for, for that type of household compared to those that say the main source of income is labor income. We could try to use econometric um, methods to see which one is uh, driving inequality. We haven't done that, but we'll try that. Yeah, uh, on horizontal inequality. Uh, that's why in the first place, uh, differentiating horizontal inequality from vertical and differentiating between episodic and routine is really crucial uh, in the start of the paper. Actually, we try both types of inequality because, and okay, before that one, measuring horizontal inequality has always been a problem. Not easy to have the consistent measure of that one. Say, for example, we have the Gini coefficient based on the household survey, but the household survey uh, does not collect the ethnic identity of the, the respondents for political reasons. So, so we can't uh, create a, a, a group Gini, for example, based on ethnicity, based on the household survey. So we, we, we try to find uh, the proxy of horizontal inequality from the census data. And we construct the uh, education group Gini based on the census data. So we have that one, based on education's group Gini, uh, and also uh, education's uh, group coefficients of variations based on uh, ethnic groups and also religious group from the census data. And as, as you know from the uh, theoretical perspective, we shouldn't link horizontal inequality and routine violence. If you want to link uh, uh, horizontal inequality, you have to link that one with ethnic violence. So in the ethnic violence uh, uh, sections, the results, we try both. Okay, we try both. We suspect that the power, the explanatory power of horizontal inequality is much higher than the explanatory power of, horizontal, uh, of vertical inequality. But we also find the significant, although uh, uh, albeit less powerful role of vertical inequality on ethnic conflict. So, so the way we interpret that one, because of the changing nature of collective violence in Indonesia from the period of democratic transitions, uh, to the current period after the, uh, all the uh, 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 chaotic transition has passed. So what we are saying here is the nature of the recent ethnic violence is closer to the characteristic of routine violence. Not episodic anymore, much, but less, not close to the episodic nature, like uh, ethnic violence during the democratic transitions. So, so that's the way we understand this one. So we try both, uh, vertical and horizontal in the context of uh, uh, ethnic uh, violence. So, so we try both, but for the, for the uh, routine violence, we only try, uh, we try both as well, but there is no interesting result in terms of the role of vertical inequality and routine violence. So, so that's why we need to match the concept that we start uh, at the beginning with the empirical strategy, not just looking at significant relationships. So that's, that's, that's I think, my, my answer. Okay, the, the last one about the, what about others? Okay, you are right. When you want to explain violence, everything under the sun could play different rules. But here you have limitations. So I, I, I'm not the fan of putting everything on the right, si right hand side of the, of the equations. Uh, the way I always approach empirical strategy is you set the framework, solid framework at the beginning. What is your variable of interest? And then, limited amount of controls that you want to put in because you can't put everything on the sun, uh, under the sun in the right hand side. That's always my approach after uh, uh, having a couple of years of experience. And second, uh, from the theoretical perspective, of course you are right, uh, any kinds of dominant power at the local level. 
a uh, different uh, 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 capability of police force, for example, a different uh, 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 implementation of law and order uh, between different regions uh, <coughs> within the country, all can play a role in, in, in variations of uh, routine violence. But the question is, we, we are still struggling to find the data. Maybe this is the next <laughs> Uh, uh, project, a uh, different way to explain uh, uh, variations of routine violence in, in one country context. Uh, thank you for, for, for your concern, but uh, uh, in this one we are interested in uh, inequality and violence. <laughs> if there's just one or two questions, uh, because we are running out of time. Yes, yes, please. Well, I want you to ask. Anja Rita Ketokoski, still. Um, I am. Uh, I have been working a lot with UNESCO uh, at the time when the Culture of Peace project was in uh, going on in Africa and in uh, other places. And um, violence is an important uh, issue in. It. UN context, UN women is focusing a lot on it. Many countries, I think Australia also might have focusing, been focusing on it. So I'm worried about not, not seeing the obvious links between uh, cultural violence and uh, violence. So you can't uh, split it into small pieces there are so many reasons why uh, the low level, what you call routine violence, it can be very brutal, as you know. Women die of it. It's called uh, femicide in Latin America, where they do, do uh, discuss it. So, so in that sense, I don't think there is a general violence without speaking about the context where the culture of violence or the culture of peace is uh, performed. And of course, uh, national uh, statistics on violence, um, as far as I know, Indonesia has ratified both UN conventions uh, uh, and uh, especially the Convention on the Elimination of All Kinds of uh, Discrimination Against Women, and also other conventions that would make it, make it important to have the statistics. I don't think, I think we agreed in 1977 already in the United Nations that uh, statistics have to be gender segregated. Thank you. Uh, I agree, fully agree with you with the concern that uh, you just said. Uh, what, what my response would be this is uh, 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 clearly a future agenda. Say, for example, from the data set that the World Bank has developed so far, uh, they recorded each incidence of violence with all kinds of variables or characteristics embedded to that, to that uh, particular incidence. Say, for example, who are involved uh, 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 what kind of uh, interventions uh, 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 done by the police or whatever, and w what is the outcome. So I think to extract okay, the gender dimensions from the large database, I think this would be a very fruitful uh, uh, way to really uh, try to reclassify the data. But that kind of atom has not been done has not been done. So, but this is a very important uh, uh, agenda to really look at the database to consider that kind of uh, uh, coding system. So the data is there. Now is to go to the thousands of records of the violence during that uh, in such a large country and uh, over a couple of years. So go into each of the particular uh, 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 violence records and find out the violence targeted against women, for example. So that has not been, I mean, I'm not sure whether uh, the, 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 the uh, organizations that is dealing with the, the data, no, I'm, I'm not part of the uh, construction of the data, I'm the, the customer of the data. So, so I think this will be something that I can say. Look, this is really important. Okay, so, so I, 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 this is really open the, the, the future uh, agenda.
Thank you very much. We, we need to bring this to a close. I would like to thank the presenters very much for the presentation and for all of you uh, for uh, your active participation. Thank you once again. Thank you.